As we look more deeply at the idea of revelation, we're going to uh, examine the stages of revelation. Uh, what does it look like for God to gradually manifest himself to humanity? And this information is taken from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 50 to 73. And in fact, these slides are all from those paragraphs in the Catechism. And that section of the Catechism actually echoes Dei Verbum, which is the Second Vatican Council's document on divine revelation, uh, Dei Verbum paragraphs 2 through 4. And in class, we're going to be looking more deeply at Dei Verbum paragraphs 2 through 4. Uh, so perhaps we can start out with Dei Verbum paragraph 2, where it gives us um, a bit of the background of revelation, in particular, why did God reveal himself? And the Catechism quoting Dei Verbum says, It pleased God in his goodness and wisdom. And so pause there and simply note that the first thing the Catechism wants to tell us is that revelation flows from God's goodness and wisdom, from his uh, eternal uh, love for us and his plan for us. So in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself and to make known the mystery of his will. Notice it names two things that God reveals. God reveals himself and uh, the plan, the mystery of his will, right? Uh, his will was, so it then goes on, well, what is God's will? What is the mystery of his will? His will was that men should have access to the Father through Christ, the Word made flesh, in the Holy Spirit, and thus become sharers in the divine nature, to live the life of God's Trinitarian love. So again, note, the principal object of revelation, what is revealed, is twofold. God himself is revealed and his plan of salvation for us. So to highlight this, when it says that God reveals himself, that is to say it's not simply new content that's made known to us in Revelation. It's not simply uh, hitherto unknown facts or truths. It's not simply a list of propositions that happen to be true about God. God reveals himself to us. It's much like any other relationship that we come to learn things about a person, but what's truly revealed is the person. And these two are intimately related, that God reveals himself, how? through his love for us and his plan of salvation. So the two go hand in hand. God's plan of salvation for us reveals God himself to us. And in God revealing himself, that is his saving plan for us. And this tells us, this paragraph tells us the purpose or the final cause of revelation. Why did God reveal himself in his wisdom and goodness? It's to call us into intimate communion with himself, to become sharers in the divine nature. It's about our salvation. It goes on to say in the Catechism that God who dwells in unapproachable light, that is the God we can't know without revelation, God who dwells in unapproachable light wants to communicate his own divine life to the men he freely created in order to adopt them as his sons in his only begotten son. This is speaking more of that plan of salvation to call us into his divine life, to adopt us as sons, to enter into communion with us. By revealing himself, God wishes to make them, us, capable of responding to him and of knowing him and of loving him far beyond their natural capacity. So notice here, this special revelation or supernatural revelation is beyond that um, uh, general or natural revelation we talked about. General or natural revelation never talked about God entering into communion with us, adopting us as sons and daughters, uh, sharing in his divine life. Uh, and this is speaking of knowing him and loving him far beyond our own natural capacities. So where our human limitedness or finiteness falls short of God, revelation steps in and bridges the gap. God has come to meet us in that revelation. So God reveals himself, his plan of salvation, and he does so to bring us into relationship with him in a way that far exceeds our natural capacities. The Catechism goes on. The divine plan of revelation is realized simultaneously by 
deeds and words, right? By actions and words, which are intrinsically bound up with each other and shed light on each other, right? So God reveals himself in his actions, deeds, and his words. God doesn't just reveal in propositions, in true facts about himself. He reveals himself in the events of history. And notice this, uh, for the, the children of the Exodus, the actual Exodus generation that came out of slavery from Egypt, the, the Exodus, God wasn't revealed to them through the book of Exodus. They didn't sit down and read the book of Exodus. God revealed himself through the event of the Exodus, through him actually leading them out of slavery. It was God's action in history, right? His deeds. Now those are handed on to us in words. But notice this is how a person reveals themselves, right? A person is revealed through deeds and acts that shed light on each other. Uh, going back to the paragraph, it says, it involves, this plan of revelation involves a special divine pedagogy, right? A way that we are led. God communicates himself to us gradually, right? As any good teacher uh, teaches things bit by bit and builds upon what's been taught before, God does the same thing. He prepares humanity for the next stage of that revelation. This is not just how a teacher uh, teaches material. This is how a person reveals him or herself, right? Uh, we don't disclose ourselves to another person all at once. We do so gradually to become accustomed to the other person. So God is a good teacher and God is a as one who wants a personal relationship with us, introduces himself to humanity gradually. Uh, it goes on to say, he prepares him, that is, God prepares the human person to welcome by stages the supernatural revelation that is to culminate in the person and mission of the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. So this gradual revelation happens in stages where God is revealing himself to us in, in broader and broader and more specific ways. It occurs in history. God enters into history to gradually reveal himself, and it culminates in Christ. So we can say from everything that we've put together so far that revelation is historic salvific. Historic salvific. Revelation occurs in history, gradually, in real events, in, in space and time, right? It happens in history, and it's ordered towards, it, it journeys towards, its purpose is our salvation, historic salvific. Or we could simply say that Revelation is the story of salvation history, God's provident guiding of history uh, along the way towards our salvation in which he reveals himself. So we can look at these stages of Revelation, and the Catechism and Dave Verboom kind of outline uh, these. Uh, the primordial revelation in nature and to our first parents, uh, Adam and Eve. The covenant with Noah, uh, and this is bordering between general revelation and special revelation. Then the calling of Abraham, the forming of the people of Israel, which talks about the covenant and the prophets. And then the culmination of that revelation, it finds its high point, its definitive point in Christ. So let's take a look at these stages. Begins with this primordial revelation uh, in creation. It says, God who creates and conserves all things by his word, provides men with constant evidence of himself in created realities. This is that um, general or natural revelation we looked at in our last video. It goes on to say, and furthermore, wishing, wishing to open up the way to heavenly salvation, he manifested himself to our first parents, Adam and Eve, from the very beginning. Right. So this means God wished to reveal himself to the human person from the beginning. This was part of God's plan for creation was to initiate this historic salvific revelation. Uh, had, sin entered, had sin entered the picture or not, God was calling his creation to intimacy with himself. Uh, revelation, his self-manifestation being a part of that. Uh, it says he invited them, our first parents, to intimate communion with himself and clothe them with resplendent grace and justice. So God's plan of revelation was already beginning in those first chapters of Genesis. It goes on to talk about Noah, which is an interesting uh, place to go when speaking of revelation. Why focus on Noah? 
Uh, the Catechism says, After the unity of the human race was shattered by sin, God at once sought to save humanity part by part. So notice uh, that God's plan of re revealing himself did not end with sin. In fact, he sets out on this rescue mission that's called salvation, this historic salvific revelation. It says the covenant with Noah after the flood gives expression to the principle of the divine economy toward the nations. Now, that word divine economy, anytime you see the word economy in theological speak, or most of the time, think work. So uh, if you reread that, it says the covenant with Noah after the flood gives expression to the principle of the divine work of God's work toward the nations. That is the Gentiles, the peoples. In other words, towards men grouped in their lands, each with its own language, by their families, in their nations. This is saying that revelation and uh, a historic salvific revelation occurred before the calling of the people of Israel, before Abraham. This answers the, the critique uh, of some who say, was God simply silent for ages upon ages before he called Abraham? And the answer is no, that God has revealed himself to individuals and peoples throughout the ages, but is, is an example of, in, in turn, either this general natural revelation or, in a case of Noah, a much more specific supernatural revelation. Um, sure, those uh, that revelation to those in the lands, each with their own language, their families, their nations, being that it wasn't special supernatural revelation was vague, it was admixed, uh, their understanding that was mixed with error, but it wasn't as if God simply was remaining silent throughout those ages. When we turn to Abraham, we have something new. It says, in order to gather together scattered humanity. And notice now we have the social character of revelation pointing to the social character of salvation, right? God chooses to save us as a people, in order to gather together scattered humanity, God calls Abram from his country, from his kindred and his father's house, and makes him Abraham. That is the father of a multitude of nations. The people descended from Abraham would be the trustee of the promise made to the patriarchs, the chosen people, called, now get this, to prepare for that day when God would gather all his children into the unity of the church. So this call of Abraham, by which he'd become the father of many nations, was a preparation for the church. They would be, that is, uh, this people gathered together under Abraham, they would be the root onto which the Gentiles would be grafted. This is the language of Paul in Romans, once they came to believe. So this is, uh, this call of Abraham is God starting to gather, not just individuals, not just families, not just even nations, but gathering a universal people to himself. And notice again this gradual forming, this gradual revelation in history where God slowly calls first individuals, families, and now an, uh, a nation to himself in preparation for what is going to be uh, one holy Catholic and universal church. So in the next video, we're going to pick up on the next stage of Revelation, which is God forming his people Israel.